Ancient traditions describe this in the language of their time. Not only do they say that we are connected to the world around us, just the way Western science is now discovering, they invite us one step further, and they say, here's how you apply it in your life. They left us very, very clear instructions saying this is the way you use this power, this inner technology within you to bring about change in your world, to bring about healing in your body, to bring about peace in your families and in your communities. And collectively, as many people come together, these principles work as peace between nations as well. And I'll share with you some of the, the studies that, uh, that were done uh, that describe precisely how this begins to work. One of the questions that I'm often asked with regard to this material is if these relationships exist, if they truly exist, why don't we know about them today? Why doesn't Western science understand these principles? Why are we just now discovering them? Well, the answer to that question uh, begins in our understanding that the way we view our world today, our knowledge is part of a lineage of wisdom that links us with our past. And we know that that link the link that ties us with those who have come before us has been broken at least two times in recorded history. Twice in recorded history, something happened, an event occurred, and we lost information. And in some instances, it's information pertaining precisely what we're doing right now. The first one of those breaks was with the, the burning of the Great Library of Alexandria in the fourth century. While we don't know precisely what was in that library, what we do know is that Roman historians had cataloged volumes and volumes of information, scrolls is the way that the material was written at that time. Uh, the Roman historian Kalamachos, for example, cataloged over 536,000 scrolls in the Great Library of Alexandria before it was burned, and many of them were very ancient in that time, in the fourth century. And we know that the scrolls contain some of the most ancient uh, documents of, of the Hebraic, uh, ancient Hebrew traditions, of the Egyptian astronomical traditions and medical traditions, much of the wisdom that had been passed down from thousands of years earlier, uh, describing our relationship to our world, to one another, and perhaps to something even greater. When that library burned, we know we lost tremendous amounts of information then. And the second time was with the edits of the Western biblical texts, the biblical traditions in the fourth century uh, as well, in the year 325 AD. It was during this time in the early Christian traditions when the Emperor Constantine pulled together a council. Uh, and at that time there was no biblical text, nice neat compiled text the way we see it today. It was a loose assemblage. Uh, many of the, of the texts were redundant. Some of them were poorly written. Uh, and very few people were able to access this material. And Constantine, in an effort to make it more accessible to a broad general audience, pulled together a council within the church and said, Council, make me some recommendations. What should we leave in? What should we take out? How should we arrange this material? And, and the result of that was what we call today our Western biblical text, biblical tradition. We know that at least 20 books were completely removed, and another 20 to 25 were uh, tremendously edited, and the remaining texts were condensed and rearranged into what we see today uh, as, as, our, uh, as our biblical text. So as good as our Bible is today, the best biblical scholars will openly and freely uh, admit that it is incomplete. And we know this because we're finding these documents in places like the Dead Sea Scrolls Library. This is why they were so controversial. When we found the Dead Sea Scrolls for the first time, we were able to see many of these books in their original form. Some of them hadn't been seen for 1,700 years. And interestingly, many of the books that were edited or taken out completely are precisely the documents that describe our relationship to the universe and the creation around us through the power of human emotion. So now that science is beginning to tell us in its language, ancient spiritual traditions have shown us in their way and in our own texts and documents, we're seeing references uh, to precisely how these principles work. The question is, how do we apply them in our lives? How do we go about making use of this relationship between thoughts, feelings, and emotions inside of our bodies and what's happening in the world around us? Well, perhaps the, the best place to begin is by defining uh, what a thought and a feeling and emotion really are. Um, I've had this conversation with my mom many, many times. Mom always says to me, she goes, I always thought feelings and emotions were the same thing. 
And while they're closely related, there is, uh, there is a difference. So if we think of a, of a chart, if you look at the ancient charts of the energy centers in our bodies, the chakra centers, if you will, what we see is the lower three energy centers of our bodies, they are closely associated with what we call the power of human emotion. And the ancients said we're capable of only two primary emotions. They said we're capable of the emotion of love and whatever we believe the opposite of love really is. Whether we think of that as fear or hate, uh, and when you get really deep into the traditions, what we find is, is there are actually both polarities of the same force. So in those lower centers, the power of emotion, uh, we have two primary experiences, love and whatever we believe the opposite of love really is. This is a, a power, it's a force that drives us forward in life and it tears down the walls, uh, knocks down the barriers that stand between us and the things that we hold dear in our lives. Emotion, however, is scattered. It has to be focused. You can think of it as a power. If you know people that live strictly in their emotions, uh, you know that sometimes their lives can be a little chaotic. Well, the emotions need to be focused, and this is where the power of thought or logic come in, and it's associated with the upper energy centers of the body. Thought is what gives focus or direction to the emotions. In other words, we have a thought about something. Uh, we have a thought about uh, a cloudy day outside and that thought into that thought we pump we fuel the power of the the emotion either our love of that rainy day or our fear of what that rainy day may bring to us and by doing so when we marry the power of emotion with the direction of the thought by virtue of that we create a feeling so feeling by definition is the union of emotion and the thought and the one energy center interestingly enough that is not accounted for in all the other systems uh, that remains unused in these ancient systems uh, is the heart center and this is the one that is dedicated to the power of feeling. We feel in our hearts. So the feeling that we have in our hearts is the language that speaks to the field that Western science is now beginning to, to understand through, through their experiments. It's the power of human feeling that is the language that opens the door to the possibilities of what we create in our world. Well, scientists today, as they think about this field, uh, it is so new, the idea is so new, that they've yet to agree even on a single term. Some scientists call this the quantum hologram. Uh, some call it nature's mind. Dr. Ed Mitchell, former Apollo astronaut, calls this nature's mind. Uh, scientists like Stephen Hawking call it the mind of God. As varied as the names appear to be, they're all speaking about essentially the same field and they describe this field as a web or a net that underlies the fabric that links everything together. And it is this fabric, this web, this net is what we speak to with the feelings in our bodies, with the feelings in our hearts. Ancient traditions not only recognized this relationship, they invite us one step further and they left precise instructions in terms of how we apply this in our lives. In the late 1980s, I was an engineer working in the defense and aerospace corporations. I began exploring these concepts as an engineer, looking in the world around me to understand the history of those who have come before us. And it is that thinking that led me into the journeys of some of the most amazing places in the world, from the temples in Egypt, to the Andes Mountains in Bolivia and Peru, uh, into India and Nepal, the highlands of central China and Tibet, all through the American desert southwest searching for information and clues that would help us to understand how we relate to the world and how we can use this, this power of feeling, this power uh, that speaks the language, the world around us. So as an engineer, when I began studying the principles of those who have come before us, the information that they left so that we could understand our relationship to the world around us and, uh, and this ancient technology that today we call prayer, my thinking was, that this kind of information would be best preserved in places that have been least disturbed by Western civilization. Uh, and this thinking led me into a journey, uh, first time in 1998, into the highlands of central China, into Tibet, where we had the opportunity to explore 12 monasteries and two nunneries, speaking through the translators to those who actually live these principles in their lives. And this is the value of going to a place like Tibet, a living culture. Uh, we can go into temples 
in Egypt or temples, or the Mayan temples in the Yucatan, and as fascinating as they are and as much information as they hold, the cultures that left that kind of information no longer exist. So at very best, we are speculating in terms of what they're saying to us. When we go into a monastery in Tibet, we can actually speak with the people who are there and we can ask them, when we see your prayers on the outside, what are you doing on the inside? What happens? What happens to your body? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What are you emoting? Well, it was in Tibet where it carries us far beyond uh, where simply offering the words will carry us. Western prayer researchers today identify four modalities of prayer. They say when we pray in the West, we use one or some combination of these four modes of prayer. Uh, the first is an informal prayer that's called a colloquial prayer. Uh, I had a friend of mine that lived in, uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco that would say this informal prayer coming home from work uh, every Friday on, on, the, uh, on the interstate. Dear God, if you let me get to the Conoco station before my tank runs out of gas, I'll never let my tank get this low again. Uh, and that is an informal prayer to God. Uh, the second mode of prayer is what is called a petitionary prayer where we petition the powers to be. We petition the angel or angels or we petition God. Amen. Dear God, I, uh, I claim the right to heal and be healed now in all past, present, future manifestations. That would be a petitionary kind of prayer. The third mode of prayer is a ritualistic prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep. God is great. God is good. And the fourth mode of prayer is a prayer that has no words. It's simply a, a meditative prayer where we become aware of, uh, of a presence around us and in the silence. Uh, and there's some uh, dispute as to whether or not this is even a mode of prayer or not. But this is the way Western prayer researchers typically think of prayer in our world today. And as good as those modes are, and as, as well as they describe the way we pray, there's always been another mode, a fifth mode, that is not described in these uh, modalities. And this is precisely what the abbot in Tibet was describing to us. He was describing a mode of prayer that's based in feeling. And he said, we must feel the feeling as if the prayer has already been answered. And in that feeling, we are speaking to the forces of creation, allowing the world to respond to us, allowing this field, the quantum hologram, the mind of God to respond to us with what it is that we are feeling within our hearts. So, rather than praying and feeling powerless in a given situation, dear God, please let there be peace in the world. This mode of prayer invites us to feel as if we are participating in that peace, just as John Wheeler suggested, that we are part of all that we see. And as we feel the peace in our world or the healing in the bodies of our loved ones, we are actually empowering the field to mirror that back to us. Uh, in a way that will bring those changes about in our lives and in our world. Well, this is precisely what the abbot was saying to us in the monastery in Tibet. In the early 1990s, I had the opportunity to see this mode of prayer, this feeling-based prayer, uh, enacted in, in a real-time situation. And I'd like to share the story because it, it perhaps best describes what otherwise is, uh, is a nebulous kind of rain. And I called my friend. And I asked him, I said, there's so much rain, the valleys are flooding, the roads are flooding. What in the world is going on? And he was quiet just for a moment. And he said, that's the part of the prayer. He said, I never quite figured out. So I have no way of scientifically validating that my friend's prayer had anything to do with that rain. But the correlations are so high. We see it happen so many times, we know there is an effect. 1972, 24 United States cities were used to conduct an experiment where people were trained to feel the feeling of peace in a very specific manner and they were strategically, strategically placed in these cities. Each city had populations over 10,000 people. Uh, and these were documented in some of the very well-known uh, uh, TM studies that were done uh, back in the, uh, in the early 70s. And what happened was during the time that the people were feeling the feelings of peace in the community around them, beyond the buildings where they were having their experience, 
the communities experience statistically measurable reductions in crime. Violent crimes against people, traffic accidents declined. Uh, in some cities like Chicago, where the stock exchanges, the stock market soared while peace was in place. And when they stopped their prayers, all those statistics reversed. And they did this time and time again to such a degree that the effect could be measured and it was applied in an even greater experiment that was uh, documented in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, 1988. And this was the experiment. It was called the International Peace Project in the Middle East. And what happened during the Israeli-Lebanese War in the early 1980s as a result of these earlier studies? People who were trained to feel the feelings of peace were positioned throughout the war-torn areas in Israel and Lebanon. And during the time, what the researchers called the window, the prayer window, when they were feeling, people were trained to feel the feelings of peace in their hearts, when they were feeling those feelings, terrorist activities dropped to zero. Crimes against people declined. Emergency hospital room visits declined. And they tried doing these experiments different times of day, uh, different days of the week to make sure it wasn't an effect of, of weeks or weekends or holidays or or at different times of the month to make sure it wasn't the effect of lunar cycles affecting people. And when the studies were complete, what they found, although we may not know precisely why this effect happens the way it happens, we know the correlations are so high that when a certain number of people begin to feel the feeling of peace or healing in their bodies in one place, the effect carries into the community beyond the place where these people are. And it is so precise that we now know, the statisticians were able to determine precisely the number of people that are required to kickstart, to jumpstart this kind of an effect. So I'll share the, uh, the formula and then I'll describe what that formula means. The effect is first noticed when a certain number of people are participating. And that number, the minimum number, is the square root of 1% of a given population. So, what does that mean? If you have a city of one million people, for example, you take 1% of one million on your little calculator, and then you take the square root of whatever that 1% was, and that number tells you how many people are necessary, the threshold number, to begin the effect. Obviously, the more people that participate, uh, the greater the effect. Uh, for a city of one million people, that number is only about 100. In a world of six billion people, the square root of 1% of the given population is only about 8,000 people. 8,000 people, according to these studies, are the number of people, that's all that's required, to feel the feelings of peace in their hearts in a given moment in time, simultaneously, to kickstart, to jumpstart that consciousness linked through the field, as we know the field exists today, before that peace is felt in the world around us.